Welcome to the first ever Right to Research in Africa conference. Kathleen, you're doing some exciting stuff. My name is Kathleen Siminyu and I am from Nairobi, Kenya. When it comes to doing sophisticated things with language tools, it's super simple to do them with English or, you know, another major Western language. So what then happens is that we as Africans who our first or preferred languages may not be the Western languages are then second class citizens on the internet and on digital platforms. So one of the things that you might want to do is just having metadata that just tells you, here's a new story, this new story is connected with this topic, right? We take it for granted that if you use uh, other news aggregation tools, you can just choose these things and then they show up in like, you know, in English and German, but then we, would, we, won't, we don't have that in our, in our languages. We can use AI to, to build language tools to bridge the gap. It would be great if automatic transcription or machine translation was available from, you know, Kiswahili to Luya or from African language X to African language Y. It would be great if educational material was easily translatable from English to, you know, another local language or uh, medical information. And those are gaps that um, we can fill. We are enabling alternative futures. So within the Masakani Research Foundation, uh, we have a project known as Decolonize Science, and it's working to make accessible scientific material in various African languages. In the context of machine translation, the ideal data set is aligned text. And when I speak about aligned, this is at sentence level. If in Kiswahili I have the term Miminim's Chana, I want an accompanying English text that says I am a girl. Uh, and then this data set is fed into a machine translation model, right? So the model is seeing very many different sentences that are aligned in the various languages, and this is how we get a translation model. The Bible is a great source of aligned text for obvious reasons. It's already set out in chapters, in verses, and then the work of evangelization means that many languages, especially African languages, are actually represented in translations of the Bible. The particular data set we used is one known as JW300, and it was created or curated from texts that are published by an organization known as Jehovah's Witness. Their data set was a very rich resource in availability or inclusion of African languages. We were able to connect to young people across the continent. It was easy for them to plug in because all they needed to do was select the language they wanted to train a model for. We published loads of papers. We managed to train very many machine translation models and this work has been widely successful in research circle. Um, subsequently, beyond that comes the not so great stuff. We started to realize that, hey, we should investigate the origins of this JW300 dataset. We started to engage with legal partners. All right now, we are going to hear to Dr. Melissa, who is going to tell us what rise do they have. I am a lawyer by profession and CIPIT is actually a legal research centre. We were all agreeing that it was research work that they were doing. Um, we sort of battled a little bit to understand what will the end product of the research be? Will there be commercial use? At the time, Jehovah's Witness, if you looked at the website, it said that it was copyrighted um, care of Pennsylvania, right? That's in the US. But there's also something else interesting on the website. They had a copyright notice. You could click on it and read what do they allow you to do and what don't they allow you to do. And they really laid it out that they do not allow text data mining. It was clear that we don't want you to do this. So that means we would have to rely on the exception. Whether or not it is legal for them to use uh, text data uh, depends on the jurisdiction. For example, in the United States, there is a fair use provision that would allow a developer or researcher to use text data for particular purposes. Uh, in Kenya, there is an exception, but it is a little bit more limited, and that's what we call fair dealing. And then there are other countries, such as Ghana, where there is no such exception that exists for the use of that data. This is Masahane, based in Africa. 
do the grants allow them to test this in court or not? What in the time, we didn't have enough time to even think about these things. So the best thing to do was to write to Jehovah's Witness and say, hey, this is what we're doing. And we've seen that you don't allow us to do that, <laughs> but this is why we're doing it. And we believe that it, it would be fair use. Jehovah's Witness declined. So the models still exist, they're still published. We still have the accolades we have received for the work that has been done. But then there's now a gap in the community because it's not as easy for very new researchers to plug into the work. It's sad that even with a plea and a demonstration of how much good has come of you know, the work that they have created, it's still, it's still a blatant no. What happened with JW300, we became very, like, you know, you become very concerned about the uncertainty that this places towards research uh, within there just because now you don't have it. Uh, a clear, especially even like a single market where you even know across the continent, not just South Africa, how do we handle kind of such, such situations? The challenge with having um, exceptions in the law that have a narrow definition means that we are constantly looking for the interpretation of such narrow definitions. And it also does not allow future proofing. And future proofing is allowing for technology that we have not yet thought of to be incorporated within this exception. This means that policymakers have to really think broadly when coming up with these exceptions, or even change their mind about terming it as an exception and think about it as a positive right to actually research.